And now our host, Stephen Lee Morris. This week, we're joined by actor French Stewart, best known for his role in the NBC series Third Rock from the Sun. French was also on stage at the Cast Theater, frequently in the plays of Justin Tanner. And more recently, he's been a community activist advocating for the rights and privileges of local theater. French Stewart, welcome to Animal Farm. It is a pleasure to be here. How are you, my old friend? <laughs> I'm hanging in there. Thank you. Like, like, like the rest of us. I think we're all. That's right. We're all doing a dance on ice here. That's a, that's exactly right. But but when you're on, on thin ice, skate faster. Yep. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Um, I, I'll start with um, a report that came out from the our own intelligence agencies that the, the, the federal that is that um, I said to sum it up in in an. Ex- painfully reductive way. There were three points, three predictions, and one of them wasn't even a prediction. The first one had to do with, um, the, is, by the way, these predictions were for the next 40 years. And the first one in, in this country, the United States, and they had to, the first one had to do with global influence. And it posited the possibility that the authoritarian regimes of the world, such as Iran, um, North Korea, Russia, and China would uh, gain global hegemony and um, reduce the influence of representative democracies such as the United States and Western Europe. That there was a second option presented that the influence of the United States would reemerge and that representative democracy would continue to be a prevailing, um, a prevailing value. They couldn't predict which way that would go. That was the, good. the second point was that, um, and this was a prediction, is that global famine and mass migration leading to millions of refugees would continue to be exacerbated by global warming in the next 40 years. And that is an pr- issue where everybody is gonna have to deal with. And the final, the final one was that um, people would, communities globally, individual communities, would continue to be divided. They would continue actually to eat each other alive because of the silos, the silos of agreement of, I would call it righteous agreement that's fostered by social media. And they said that would continue to be an ever growing problem. With that, with that particularly point number three, I'm just interested in your thoughts on as a community builder yourself, what has happened to us are we fitting in box number three and is it solvable? I, I, I believe that the last one is the most dangerous because uh, uh, I believe that our algorithms are being manipulated. You know, we're, we're, the more you go on social media and you like something, the more they lead you to something. And the more you block someone you don't like, the more they funnel people into two separate groups. And then the more they become tribal and it happens uh, on Facebook pages, it happens in families, you know, for Christmas, it happens yeah. in a country and it's happening to us right now. I, I believe the, the, the information that we are getting is causing us to be uncivil with each other because it's, it, it, it sort of just starts to work on your brain where you, you, you look for the thing that you want and you see it with, MSNBC, you see it with Fox News. People are looking for the thing that they want. You see it with, uh, you go on the, the, on Facebook and you say, uh, oh, hey, you know, my, my hair is like uh, sort of starting to fall out. I, I might like to get some new hair. And then suddenly you just get like, hey, want new hair? Got new hair. We got new hair for you. And so we're being funneled into separate uh tribes, which is not helping anything. And I think that that's the thing that's the most dangerous. I see it in the theater community. I see it in my home. I see it everywhere. And so uh, that's the most dangerous is just a, a, a laser focused manipulation of information and how you get it and what it does to your brain. Your wife and others, such as Martha Dempson, yeah, I've been working on Senate Bill 805, which is uh, to undo the effects, the pernicious effects of Assembly Bill 5, 
which is now currently legislation and it's in place. And right. still the nonprofit arts organizations do not have a carve out, even though Uber and Lyft do. And, and the legislation was targeted for Uber and Lyft. They got out of it and, and, and here we are. They are working hard I'm, I'm, and you're watching, particularly you're watching your wife who must on some level believe in community um, do, well, she can speak for herself. She's already been on the show, but do you believe in the possibility of community and, and, or is this just some kind of uh, romantic nostalgia? Remember the, de the decade when we were all together and we had a unified cause? Yeah. Um, and yeah, uh, I <laughs> is that possible? Yeah. Is that possible? Or do, does it take crisis to bring us to, we are in a crisis and yet we're still really divided or, or are we, are we not? Are, are there pockets of you? What's going on? Out there? I can't, I yeah. can't oh. You know, it, it's, in, it's interesting and it, and it comes back to the same thing that we were talking about as to, you know, who gets what information, because when we were, uh, you know, when my, my wife and I were in the, uh, lawsuit against equity to, uh, save 99 seat theater um the information that was going to new york was not the same information that was coming to los angeles yeah. and so i think there was always a lot of confusion right now uh with the human infrastructure bill i feel like there's sort of hope because i feel like what we're talking about is the fact that uh, you know uh Part of why Los Angeles theater always had a hard time is that it wasn't subsidized, subsidized the same way that New York was. New York had like, you know, and the, the numbers are here someplace, but I got a brain fog. Um, but New York was always subsidized and we always had to sort of struggle with all of it. And, you know, we've both been in this community for a really long time. And I think that there started to be this false narrative where there were these fat cat producers that were not paying actors. When the fact of the matter was, there just wasn't any money. Every producer I knew was a guy living in an apartment with uh, cat hair on his sweater. <laughs> you know, yeah. it just wasn't like, it was just, they were digging it out to break even. Or the people who did them. actually own a home in the Valley had that home triple mortgaged up to the kazoo to pay for their theater yeah exactly that's the other producer that's yeah. the other that's the other producer and the other producer was uh some friend of yours that you thought was sharp that you just laid one on and you were like uh oh, hey could you just produce this because you're the only one with computer skills and all these other dum-dums can't get together like you know could we you know it was never back in the days of the justin tanner stuff at the cast Andy Daly would basically make a set out of stuff that he found on the street. Yeah. yeah. And so, but, but the, the thing is, is that with the, the funding is there and it's coming from the COVID relief bill. And so if the funding is there and you can give these people, uh, and I believe it's a, uh, arts organizations with four, 1.4 million or less, Oh, that's come down. It was 1.9. Yeah. yeah, it's like come yeah. down. Yeah. And then, um, but they're asking for a billion dollars and we just want a piece of that because we didn't get the carve out that the musicians got. Yeah. And so a lot of this could push it over the edge a little bit. And I think it's something that equity and LA theater communities could actually agree on. And so I think that's where the hope is that that funding from, because uh, arts are infrastructure, people are infrastructure. You don't get it as much in, in high schools anymore. And so that's, that's infrastructure. I mean, people don't, people don't travel to Italy to see a mall. They travel there to see art and there should be art and there should be infrastructure for art and for people. And I think that's where there's an overlap with equity and with the LA theater community where it could actually work, where it's just, hey, help us with some money because it's, it's a theater is not just a theater. It's sitting next to a restaurant and people right. want right. drinks before, they want drinks after, they want food before, maybe food after, and it feeds the community. That's a, th that's a thriving, that's a model for a thriving financial scene. And, 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 a, for, and, for and, a, and a fun, yeah, in a fun neighborhood. Yeah, I'm in, I'm, I'm in West Hollywood and right now the neighborhood is less fun 
not just because of the quarantine and that things have shut down, but because like a lot of the really fun businesses are being torn down for housing. Yeah. And so like huge apartments. And I, I know that people need places to be because that's another thing. There are a lot of tents. But you also have to plan a community <laughs> and make it seem fun and something that a person would enjoy and not just a function. Yes, yes. I have a somewhat of an esoteric question. I'm going to lay one on you here. Um, okay. And that's, it, it goes down to some people, you know, there's all kinds of stories where these brilliant creative minds who did this incredibly inclusive, gorgeous work, whether in painting or in the theater or in music, were actually in their personal lives, total assholes. And um, is that, if we're going to, if social media is continue going to, to put us into camps of the virtuous and the exiled, um, do you think there's room for the exiled to be permitted by the community to continue making art in, in when the, the algorithms are strategic, almost strategically dividing us up. Yeah, I, I would like to think so because otherwise you're gonna, uh, you're gonna f funnel art into the same way that the algorithm funnels everything else where there will be one thing that's acceptable. And so there's just gonna be a repetition of seeing the same story over again. I like to, look at somebody like, you look at somebody like, uh, we were talking about Hemingway or Picasso. Yes, yes. And if they would like hold up right now. I, I personally, like, I can look at Picasso and think, oh, he's a genius. But then I also think, yeah, he also wanted to like put a woman's nose on the side of her face. And I don't think he liked her. <laughs> <laughs> like there's like parts of it where you're breaking down a human being or trying to understand uh, who they are, but everything doesn't have to be pretty. Sometimes I like to have information about people so I know who not to hang out with. Yeah. And if we silence them or silence their art, then uh, how do you know? <laughs> I mean, I, you know, it's like, it's maybe self-preservation, but I also, uh, there are people like Hemingway and I think, well, he was a beautiful writer. I just didn't, necessarily like who he was but the writing is like gorgeous yes but i'm not exactly crazy about the person and i think there has to be room for that i smell a lot of book burning coming yeah. up yeah and in uh, academia they're, they're talking they're they're trying there's moves afoot to cancel shakespeare because of um his yeah. uh, misogyny and, and and attitudes and what have you um and which you know, that, that raises a lot of questions about somebody whose work has survived for 400 years yeah. um, on the virtue of the beauty of the words and the poetry. Um, yeah, and, uh, and, and you can't, there's also a, a part of it where I feel you can't blame a caveman for being a caveman. Yeah, yeah. And both people, individual human beings, but also cultures and time, uh, should be allowed a learning curve. Yeah. I'm not yeah. the same person I was yeah. even, you know, 12 years ago. I remember I used to say, you know, oh, that's retarded all the time, ah, you know, and I don't anymore. But like, if you go back to 2009 or something and like dig up some stuff, you're like, oh, he's horrible. I want my learning curve. And I want that for other people too, because we're life, People say that life is short. It's not, it's long. It goes on forever, <laughs> you know? But I also, uh, I wanna see other people uh, thrive or be allowed to, you think about somebody like, uh, like George Foreman, the boxer, and he used to just beat people up for money in the streets of Houston. And now he's just sort of this beloved boxing champion he made his grill i want george foreman to have like i i, I find that to be inspiring yes. to see a person go through it but right now it's it's hard to see that because people are and i understand that they're angry because i mean 
I mean, let's face it, like, like the, all, all, when Me Too broke, I could feel how mad women were. I could feel how legitimately mad women were. And I'd seen my wife navigate a lot of things in business that I didn't have to navigate. Yeah. And she started to feel, oh, I, I have a voice now. I, I can navigate and I'm getting some traction. And then within a year, uh, suddenly uh, the new trope is she has to shut up because she's just a Karen. Yeah, and interesting. I'm like, how did it? How did it happen so fast? How did how did how did she get her voice and then lose it just because the weather changed? Yeah, and I know that. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I know that. I know that the world is complicated, and also we're in a pandemic, and that that's weighed on people's heads. And and well, I was gonna. Uh, I was going to ask you, what, what, do you, how much do you think this pandemic has contributed to the wackiness of things and the, uh, I would call it the atmosphere of total, of, of lack of intolerance versus what would have happened had we, had it been business as usual? I, I think, I think a lot because I think we've all been in our, our heads for a long time. And that's not to, uh, you know, I'm not trying to take away what have clearly been uh, just a, 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 a ton of building pressure with, with women, with uh, you know, people of color, with a uh, trans community where it, it's just, it, it all comes yeah. out. But I think the other thing that was added on top of everything is that we all had a lot of time to think. And sometimes that was a meditation and sometimes it was not. Yeah. And I notice a difference between uh, my friends who went through it with somebody in the house versus my friends who went through it alone or yeah. lost what is a the, pet during it, What is the lot. difference? Yeah. So, uh, uh, so I'm, I'm hoping that everybody, ideally I would love it if people gave each other uh, a little bit more grace and a little bit more of a, learning curve, but also uh, in the in your weak points, educate yourself about what what you're maybe like, listen, maybe a little bit more than you talk, which I'm yeah, I'm not great at. <laughs> so uh, I think it's just recalibrating to look at the person in front of you and love them and try and uh, listen and and connect and realize that maybe maybe they're not out to get you maybe it's just been a funky year mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is love still uh, more powerful than anger it is for me i'll tell you this i've been, I've been in show business for a long time and i know that uh I've always tried to look at it as a community and I've always tried to be a part of the community. And when I come in, I try to learn people's names. I try to be prepared. I try to make my part in the community. I try to sweep my own porch. Uh, but I've also noted that uh, in show business, sociopaths do great. <laughs> so, so I'm not sure for me, Love is the answer because that's how I'm wired. But I've seen a lot of nutty people do well and continue to do well. And so I don't know. I, I might not know the answer. Tell me about your life at home. You have a wife who is a community activist and doing extremely important work right now. And yes. you, have a, you have a daughter. Yes. And you're homeschooling. How are you doing? And, and do you see, uh, you know, do, do you see this ending or do you see these variants a, a continue going to smack us down? No, I, 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 yeah, that's, that's, that's the question because uh, science isn't my best. So I'm just going to, I'm just going to listen to Dr. Fauci <laughs> you know, and keep moving on. But uh, the first part of my pandemic was fantastic. <laughs> uh, you know, me and a kid hogging a seven-year-old, I'm, I'm a, we would paint a fence. I taught her how to play chess. Vanessa was teaching her how to play a ukulele. And then round about 
the summer, my mind became a haunted mansion. <laughs> and after that, it was like, here you go. How would you like to watch YouTube videos for seven hours? Now well, you can, <laughs> you know? And so, uh, you know, it, 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 it's been a, a, a bit of both. Uh, I thought probably that I was going to walk out of this pandemic initially with uh, an hour of just blistering stand up. And uh, uh, I got about five good minutes. <laughs> <laughs> more is coming. You need, a, you need more variants. You need more variants. Yeah, I need more variants. For your yeah, stand up yeah. routine. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> but, you know, a couple of days ago, we got, got, a, got my second shot. And that, for some reason, even if it's just symbolically, I mean, I feel awful. I feel like I've been kicked into a gang. <laughs> but uh, that, for some reason, sort of opened my heart to possibility of having a semblance of my life back. And uh, the other thing that everything taught me was that I really love my family. My family is, uh, we have endured this. Nobody yelled. Nobody you know, we, we got through it together as a family and we pushed through and we managed each other's uh, human weather. And that gives me hope. And my wife's a hero. You know, she's a hero on a lot of levels. And, and most of them she just never even talks about because she's just quiet. But how has yours gone? Mine's gone okay. It's same, same, same process. Same yeah. pro I, I play the piano. It's given, the pandemic has given me time to, to play the piano. I, um, I garden a lot. And Do I you? Hike, and I hike a lot. And, yeah. and I, I, I'm writing creatively, as is, That's nice. I think, everybody I know uh, that, that isn't, hasn't completely lost their marbles. And there are days when I've lost my marbles too. So It's uh, hard. I, I, for some reason, I, uh, you know, I did so many children's movies when I was young and you still had to do your own stunts. And so there's like a precocious redhead kid pushing you out of a tree house. And you're like, oh, I'm, I still feel that when the weather turns. So now I walk and I'll just walk West Hollywood mm -hmm. and you meet people and you see things and you dream about having a haircut. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's a weird kind of poetry. But similarly, um, I've got a wife uh, and similarly, despite being to, in the same dom domiciled in the same house 24 seven, pretty much, we have, uh, we've done okay. There's been no screaming, you know, we've navigated. Yeah. And it's been very smooth and, 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 and fairly supportive. So. Uh, Wait, I, I, yeah, I think about quarantine. So that's, that's a, that's a, a marriage tester. That's a yep. Yep. family tester. That's a brother, mother tester. It, yep. Yeah, yeah. So if you can get through that, that's that's a good that's a good feeling, and and it, obviously that's what you've you felt too. Yeah, so, um, yeah. Yeah, I, I I have, and I I I've also felt that it it was sort of nice because it, it uh, at a certain point it just became this uh, perpetual barbecue. Yeah. Where we were just we were just barbecuing, and I'm subjecting my daughter to all sorts of uh, old man music. And so now suddenly she's like, what? She likes Warren Zevon or Paul and Oates. I, don't, you know, <laughs> I put her through the ringer. So I don't know, the, the, Vanessa terms these children as uh, they're gonna be the baby Zoomers. <laughs> and we're gonna find out what they are. They're either gonna be sociopaths or the, the yeah. kindest of the kind, we don't know. And they will know more about us than we know about ourselves. That's for sure. Yeah. That's French, for sure. French Stewart, thank you for joining us. My old friend, it is so good to see you. And uh, I just have always been such a big fan. And I, I love you just dearly. And what you've done for LA theater, people will never know. Thank you, French. Likewise. Likewise. Back at you.
It's been pointed out that it's the women who are currently leading the charge to protect local theater from the pernicious effects of legislation such as AB5. Next week, we're joined by Martha Dempson, who, along with Vanessa Stewart, is one of the leading advocates for Senate Bill 805, which indeed attempts to undo some of the more pernicious effects of Assembly Bill 5. Martha is the long-term artistic director of the Open Fist Theatre, which has was in Hollywood for many years and is currently in Atwater Village. For Rough Ranch, we have a special challenge called the Puppy Challenge. It looks like this. Puppy breath. <laughs> 